Meet Paul Martini, 2001 graduate of UC San Diego's Computer Science and Engineering Department. In 2015, he and his twin brother Peter established global headquarters for IBOS in San Diego. With explosive growth, just two years later, the headquarters have moved to Boston, and San Diego has become a state-of-the-art cyber threat research center. Just what does IBOS do that has made it prosper so quickly? Our mission is actually changing the way cybersecurity is delivered and managed. We're in what's called uh, web gateway security, which is network-based security. It's not your desktop antivirus or software or anything like that. What it does is it looks at the data coming into the network um, as it's coming in, looking for things like malware. So if you think about opening up a zip file or a PDF file, uh, tell me if that's infected with a, with a Trojan or ransomware and prevent it from coming in to begin with. Uh, the same on the way out. So when the data leaves the network, uh, we need to scan that to make sure it's not your database, it's not a social security number or credit card number. So we play a big role in data loss prevention. So I would equate what we do uh, the same as the TSA at an airport or the security at a ball game where you're checking the traffic, the, the network traffic as it comes in and out of a network. But what makes it um, really challenging and really unique and, and why we're growing so much is we do this in the cloud. So we call them cloud gateways. So uh, before applying this type of security was very easy at headquarters. You just, you know, they put equipment into a server room and as the data would leave the building, you would scan it much like a security guard would uh, people. But now uh, you have employees that are not only sitting at remote offices, but they're also sitting at Starbucks or at their home. And because they access all their applications in the cloud, how do you scan the data leaving their laptop when they're sitting at a, in a Starbucks where you don't control the network? What I would equate it to is the equivalent of you know, email used to be equipment and appliances that were at your main office, and that moved to the cloud with Office 365 or cloud email. Gmail is one good example. You don't build email servers um, anymore. We're doing the exact same thing in the web gateway space, which is it's not about building equipment and managing equipment. It's about providing a service that is available anywhere an employee goes. Really, when you're thinking about data loss today, it's much different than what it was even 10 years ago. 10 years ago, it was about a USB drive, someone sticking a USB stick into a computer. Today, it's not even thought of. It's, it's going to be using the internet connection that's already in your business or home to tap into your network. The internet of things and everything being connected to the internet is providing a surface area that's so vast and so big. The amount of data is exponentially increasing. So when we look at what we do in terms of securing data, if you were imagine uh, if your job was to clean a stream and take the leaves out of the stream, the leaves would be malware and maybe data loss. So you, you're sifting through a small stream of water. Try doing that at the Colorado River. It's a, you, you're never going to finish with a net. And you can build a dam, but that's, in essence, slowing down the data movement. And so what we've done is, when we look at the challenge at exponential data growth and the, the need to scan that data, the strategy we took is horizontal scaling, which is divide and conquer approach. So uh, using a parallel uh, analogy in, in the real life, if you know a lot of people are going to show up to um, a baseball game, it's not about getting a faster security guard. You know, you want to add more lanes. And so what we've done is the exact same thing in the web gateway space, which is let's not make a bigger gateway in the cloud or anything like that. Let's divide and conquer the bandwidth. That's the only way you're going to get to terabits of bandwidth, which is an astronomical amount, 1,000 gigabits of bandwidth. When we started, um, bandwidth was one megabit per second. And we, we basically made the assumption that it would hit a, a gigabit per second, a billion ones and zeros every single second, 24 hours a day. And so now today, uh, recently, I was talking to an analyst. I said, now we're actually ready for the terabit age. So 1,000 gigabits. And the analyst said, who's going to do a terabit per second? We said, that's the exact same thing that we heard in 2004, when people couldn't imagine that kind of bandwidth. There are networks out there today that are approaching a terabit per second in a single network alone. And you can see it with streaming music, services and things like that, streaming movies at your home with Netflix. It's a science problem, but we use a very fast algorithm to allow us to then service in a mathematical fashion any amount of data for any customer. So if they say we have a terabit of data, we can mathematically tell you how many gateways you'll need horizontally, and they actually get created in under a second. So it makes it really easy for us to tackle uh, the future. When I look at the future for things like looking at data coming in and out of any network, it's not just businesses, it's your home, it's your refrigerator. I believe that this type of technology, where we're looking at network data, will apply to every home, every business, uh, anywhere in the world. So we, we want to transform 
the delivery mechanism for cybersecurity. We want to apply this technology across every home, every business throughout the world. And we want to secure every device, whether it's phones, laptops, computers, whatever it may be. At the end of the day, something needs to check the data on the way in and on the way out. What influences shaped this California native and enabled his success in the tech world? Paul shares about some very important people and experiences that helped him develop the tools to excel. So I was born um, here in Southern California. I grew up in LA. My parents, the first generation immigrants, their parents were first generation immigrants to Cuba. They actually left very young um, at the age of 17 or so uh, to, in, the, in the 50s here to, to the States. They ended up um, in Los Angeles and you know, they, they, they always had a really strong work ethic. Uh, when I grew up, uh, most of my time was spent uh, working at one of their businesses. So my, my dad's um, uh, side had a, he was into cars. So there was uh, body shops and repair shops, rebuilding engines and things like that. On my mom's side, um, it was restaurants. And so really it was a choice between one or the other. It wasn't, it wasn't mu much of an option. It was tough. You know, you're, you're young, there's, summers are, seem to be the fun time, but when you're going in uh, from 5 in the morning to 8 p.m. and having to pick between a restaurant and a shop, it is, it's not that much fun. So we spent a lot of time, you know, the restaurant side stocking shelves, um, doing all sorts of um, things like purchasing and being around that, to um, on my dad's side, rebuilding engines. There were really nice cars. Uh, there was Mercedes, BMWs, and classics as well. And there was uh, cases where, I mean, there were full uh, rebuilds of engines and things like that. So taking things apart was just part of the protocol. And I think that also set the foundation of how things work. Uh, but really, um, I think the other part of it is uh, the work ethic and the patience that you have to have when you do things. So when you're, when you're rebuilding um, even a classic engine, um, it's fun, but you have to be very patient. One small mistake, uh, a washer or spring, can really ruin the entire, their entire engine, and it takes a long time to get it done. And so uh, that patience, I think, paid off later. But it also um, set the foundation of taking, taking those things apart, understanding really fundamentally how things work, whether it's a mechanical engine or the electronic parts that go into the, the engine itself, um, which I think set the basis for, for what I did here in the future. And so as I, as I worked with them, whether it, was, or, uh, whether it was at the shop or at the restaurant, I think a few things, um, when, you, when you see someone lead by example, so you know, they would talk about the work, but I would also be participating in the work, right, and doing those hours and things like that. And I think the other thing is, I didn't get paid <laughs> to do this work, and, but I think that was important because it also set a foundation for, you know, you build something for what you're trying to achieve versus the financial benefits of that. It really makes it much, much different. Like when we look at iBoss, for example, the company wasn't built to be an IPO or to sell. It was built to, to be a great company and to change a space. So yeah, I think it was a combination of what they've said, um, what I saw, what they taught me, and it was, it, was, um, it was real. With the real world experiences his family instilled in him, Paul polished his interests and set his foundations in California's public education system, which he credits for transformational experiences that shaped his future. Downey High, uh, where I went to high school, you know, it's a public school, for me, was really foundational, I think, um, in terms of setting a foundation to get into UCSD and do these other things. But one of the things that um, I got out of it was there was really great teachers there. Um, the AP programs were phenomenal in terms of the ability to just take those classes and learn a lot from that. But I also joined wrestling. The reason I originally chose wrestling was wrestling started in September when school started. And my father said, absolutely, um, you're not going to do anything in December except for work. Uh, but actually, it was, actually turned out to be a very good thing for me because the one-on-one -on -one, self-reliance and competitiveness, the discipline and exercise, and being able to do that while you do your classes and things like that was really transformational for me. I actually recently went back to Downey High, and it was interesting to see a lot of the same teachers there, the investment that they've made in sort of research, uh, robotics. For me, it was in interesting in that it's a public school, but it's still great. And I, and I think that sometimes there's a notion that you must do private school or, you know, and I think at the end of the day, it really comes down to the staff and the teachers. Uh, you could say the same thing about universities. You know, UCSD is a public institution, but it's, a, it's such a great school. It's second to none in terms of what you can get out of it. And so I've been very fortunate that because of the high school 
that I went to with Downey, as well as um, UCSD, that I just had a really nice um, experience all the way through. UCSD was my first choice. And what was interesting is I started at UCSD, but I didn't start as a computer engineer. I was in bio and biochem, uh, bioengineering, actually. I had a lot of uh, really influential um, uh, professors and researchers. Um, uh, Dr. Vold uh, ran a biochem lab. And so I was listening to uh, Dr. Vold talk about uh, the research he was doing in NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance. And that was really fascinating to me. So you know, I really wanted to get into a lab, and it was really early. And you know, given that I was just got to UCSD, you know, a month in, they said that there was a wait. That was, you know, first you're going to be a junior to get into a lab, and there's a long wait, and they have to select you. So I, I simply, you know, right, literally right from there, I walked right to Dr. Vold's uh, lab. I didn't know what to expect. I just knocked on her door, and she opened her office, and I said, "Hey, I'm willing to do anything in your lab. Figure, wash the dishes, mop the floor, you know, anything you want." And she said, I like your attitude. And she opened the back door of her office, and that, that door opened to a massive NMR lab. There was a, a post fellow, his name was Dr. Strupen, and he was a German, very, very rigid. <laughs> he wanted to measure his own stuff. And, and she said, hey, uh, uh, Paul's now going to be your new assistant, and he's going to mop the floors and do whatever you want. And he says, I don't work with anybody, because no, I can't trust anybody to do my things. And he says, well, then just have him mop the floors. <laughs> and so I basically was very lucky, because I was able to first follow him and watch how we measured. So it wasn't just the science behind the experiment. There was things that I learned that's the experience of how to do things. And so I ran an experiment with him. Uh, uh, it was very successful. I actually, I, you know, during the middle of the experiment, I said, hey, our results are going to be off. And it has to do with the calibration of what we're using and how we, we're calibrating these, these sensors. And, he said, you know, there's no way this could be off. And I said, that's no, absolutely going to be off. So we looked at it, and he says, it's definitively going to be off. So we made those adjustments, and the results of the experiment came out phenomenal. And after that, um, Dr. Vold uh, was, was gr uh, gracious enough to say, hey, I'm going to let you run your own experiment. And so I actually ran a research um, experiment for a year and a half. And they actually thought I was a, a graduate student, because I was living in the lab. <laughs> and so I would go to the lab, and I would run to class and run back, but basically living in there. So. Um, it was just a lot of work. And I remember one of the long nights that I was there where we were really just banging our head against the wall and uh, it was, it, we thought we were at a dead end and staying up night after night after night and we made a breakthrough and that research uh, experiment ended up being very, very successful, being published in the journal of Local Biochemistry. So she really laid a foundation of research, um, how to experiment. I remember some of the things, you know, just like off the cuff kind of things that actually work. For example, I had a circuit board which was acting funny, and you know, you lick your finger and you touch a capacitor, and it tells you what the problem is. You know, it changes the frequency, but things you just don't get from a textbook. You know, if you look at what, what I did with Dr. Vold, um, it's it's research oriented at the foundation. You can read everything you want in a book. You can also do as many problems as you want, but until you really get your hands on it, to really break it down, that stuff becomes second nature, and so it allows you to think at a, at a higher level and a more complex level. And I think one of the uh, nice things UCSD did, because of their elective system, where I took a Fortran class, so it was like the, the finest class I had, and I said, you know, I, this is really my passion, and this is what I really love. This is what I'm going to dedicate my life to. And I would do this if I were paid zero. I would still do the same thing. And uh, it was because of those, that elective system. In addition, um, even more of the other classroom-related stuff, Gary Gillespie runs a great uh, computer science class. I think he, is, he spent so much time with the students, so I ended up tutoring for him. And really just really doing the hands-on coding and interacting with others uh, was also very foundational for me as well. I would say UCSD has been um, such a great foundation for me, um, just in its ability to provide uh, the tools and the people to, to set what we've done to date. And uh, for iBoss, it is the foundation, and, and still to this day, um, I reference a lot of what I've done here. Uh, but I think it's, um, it's, it's amazing uh, being one of the top ranked schools, a public school as well, to see such dedicated staff that have been here for so long, um, really investing in the students and their development, which is um, uh, really inspirational. With the inspiration and skills UC San Diego gave him, 
Paul is achieving his goal of creating the best tools for cybersecurity. What can he share with the next generation about achieving such success? To encourage others as you think about computer science or anything really, I would say the foundation has to be you got to love what you do. At the end of the day, um, they're all very difficult things, whether it's biochemistry, biology, aerospace engineering, uh, software. If you don't enjoy it, there's, first off, you're not going to get the satisfaction out of it to put in the amount of time that's required to be successful. And second, if you do, um, it'll be torture. There's some days you wake up and they're tough. <laughs> you wake up, you're, there's a challenge at um, uh, something you're trying to solve. I find it very interesting and it's fun. It's really that passion and that love for what you're doing that I think gives you a competitive edge because while another company may be doing it for other reasons, you do it anyways, but you have to have the right mindset and you really have to enjoy it uh, to be successful. Thank you.